Hi, everybody. Guess what? It's that time of the day again. It is Welcome John Kicking and Punching with Sifu Al de Cascos. So again, everybody give you a big round of applause for Sifu Al de Cascos. Hey, thank you guys. Hey, you know, there's a lot of things we want to talk about. And I want to bring on a really good and compassionate director, especially when you come into the martial arts. And yeah, if you're in any anywhere in front of his kicks and punches, then you you get a good hand experience on the learn how to do stunts. Um, he's been around with us for the last, I say, four or five decades, which makes it 30, 40 years, and is really well known. Let me just give you a little bit of background about him. Art Camacho is considered uh, one of the most accomplished directors, fight choreographers, and stuntmen in independent uh, martial arts films. Dubbed the Fight Master by Inside Kung Fu Magazine. He directed works uh, including Wild League, Assassin X, uh, I, I guess Recoil, uh, Confession of uh, Point Fighter, The Power Within, uh, Little Bigfoot. You know what? <clears throat> I'm going to let him talk about it because there's so much to, uh, to do. But anyway, um, Art has received numerous awards for for film director, uh, directing, including from Alan Horn, which is in uh, from Disney Studios, CAO, and Michael Klausman, CBS, and has been featured in several international magazines, including Black Belt, Inside Kung Fu, Karate Illustrated, and all. Oh, wow, he's almost catching up to me. <laughs> I want to meet him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is considered to be Ali's largest Spanish language magazine, La Opinion. I don't know how to pronounce it right. Dub is one of Latin Hollywood's action film direct. He is the host and director of Camacho Experience, which we're going to get more detail into that. And on uh, that's really on uh, El Real Network and is a member of the board of the Martial Arts History Museum. You know what? I mean, if I were to talk about all these credentials, these credentials will go from one end of my head all the way to the other end, which would probably be, be taller than me. <laughs> Maybe taller than, <laughs> taller than him anyway. But anyway, listen, let's go ahead and have fun with him. Welcome to the show, Art Camacho, and thank you for being with us. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Art, you know, I always want to say, say this, you know, most of the time that when people see you or when I see you, you are hiding behind the dark glass. <laughs> I mean, you know, how's about just peeping it down once and just let us see once. what you look like? Once. It's only between you and I. Nobody else should see this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's fantastic. All right. All right. You're in the tape. Right. You're in the tape after this. <laughs> right. You know, I asked you, you know, just, I mean, there's so many ways we could start, you know, but... Um, we're going to start with a couple of questions because a lot of people ask, you know, Art Camacho, you know, I mean, we hear about him in the movies and we see him as art, uh, you know, as a director. And I guess one of the questions comes up is how and why did he get started in, in directing? What led him into being what he is? So, well, first off, to address the glasses, I am blind as a bat. I am so nearsighted. So these are prescription glasses. And uh, the funny thing is, and I'll tell you a quick story, is that I, uh, I was teaching uh, one day out there. I had a, a class in, in, in Hollywood. And one day my clear glasses broke. And since I can't see, so I had to wear glasses. So once I started wearing them, they really felt good on my eyes. And that's, that's how it happened. It wasn't like intentional. It was like I had no choice at the time because I, I couldn't afford two pairs of clear glass. So I only had one. So it took them like two weeks to make another pair. But, uh, but that's how this came about. <laughs> so prescription glasses, not because I'm cool because i can't see <laughs> really um, wow but uh but second, well, yeah you are cool in the first place anyway <laughs> so that's that's getting into that see, see, that's getting I, into that go ahead you talk about it, just in life in general um i gotta tell you i i grew up and as a matter of fact i have, I have a book out of biography out, but i grew up in in, in 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 the barrio over here and you know what everybody does i mean you know you've had all the everybody has gone through everything that i've gone through when, when I tell you my story about getting beat up, bullied, the whole nine yards, I don't say it like, oh, pity me. I say it, so what? That made me what I am today. Thank God, thank God, to be honest with you, it sounds kind of weird, but thank God I got beat up. Thank God I got bullied. 
because that drove me. And this is all leading to your question because I started martial arts training when I was about 15, 16, because I did get beat up. Five guys beat me up. I have 11 stitches here, stitches here. I mean, I got beat up so bad. And for like three weeks, I was afraid to leave my house. I was so afraid. Then slowly that, that fear started turning into anger, bubbling up into anger. And so I started training in martial arts, but I, again, fat kid, no talent, no nothing. I basically started from scratch. I started Japanese karate and dropped out. Taekwondo dropped out. I kept trying different things, but nothing, nothing stuck because I just wasn't, it wasn't in me yet. And it wasn't until late, later in, in my, my late teens that I met uh, see my Sifu Eric Lee. And that was an epiphany. That was one of the life-changing experiences, along with obviously discovering Bruce Lee through films. But those two events, discovering Bruce Lee and discovering, you know, your system, Sifu Al, one out Kwendo, changed my whole life. That led to where I am today. Because at first I started training because I'd never seen anybody in real life as dynamic as Eric Lee when he's performing his katas in his heyday. And then on film, Bruce Lee was the ultimate, the ultimate. I mean, after I saw my first Bruce Lee film, I, every weekend I was buying Bruce Lee posters, pictures, anything I could get my hands on because I was so, so blown away by, by, by Bruce Lee. Mm -hmm. And, um, and slowly that's what led me to films because out of the blue, there was a period of time where I did disconnected with Steve Eric Lee. He was traveling. I was doing different things. Then one day, uh, we happened to run into each other on a movie set, Steel Justice. I was I was hired as an extra. He was in a stuntman and he saw me. He goes, all right, what are you doing over there? I go, well, I'm just an extra, Sifu. Oh, get over here. So he brought me over with the stunt guys. So I started hanging out with the stunt guys and that changed my whole life because then shortly thereafter, he started doing choreography for Tom the Dragon Wilson. And they called me up out of the blue and they, hey, all right, how much, you want to get your butt kicked uh, for 50 bucks? I thought, I'm there. I am there. That's what started it, man. I got my butt kicked. And this time they paid me, you know, <laughs> go figure. Right. And, um, and I was really, to be honest with you, I was really good at it. And I started, you know, doing it more and more. He started getting a lot of work. I started getting, you know, I was kind of helping him out, helping him out. And, and little by little, I started, got into SAG, started doing a lot of stunts, but I had such an eye at the time. Again, this is from the producers, not from me, not me talking, but I had a real good eye. <clears throat> so they started asking me to, hey, you know what? Our, the director has to move on to the next scene. So why don't you direct this scene right here? So that's how it started. I mean, they started just putting the responsibility on me to, to they give me an hour, two hours, half hour to shoot the scene that I had just choreographed. And the first ones, I messed up pretty bad. <laughs> Gotta be honest with you, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But little by little, I started studying, started watching films and really, really doing my homework. So I got really good at it. I mean, it got to a point where I was literally tasked with putting together fights in like 10 minutes and shooting them in five minutes. So you have to know what you're doing. And again, if it wasn't for the foundation of one Kondo and, and, and Sifu Lee, and of course you Sifu Al Costco's, all this wouldn't have been possible. I'll be straight up with you. I'm being totally honest. That mm. really changed my whole life. And, uh, and then I really started progressing. And that's when I started getting, you know, I choreographed probably about I don't know, about maybe 50 movies. But at the time I'd choreographed like 30 films. And in one year, two producers asked me, they, they asked me if I wanted to direct movies. I really, you know, I didn't know that they were serious, blowing smoke on my butt or whatever. But who, I- Who asked you? Who asked you? Uh, Joseph Murphy at PM Entertainment. Uh -huh. And another, uh, another uh, friend of mine, I forgot the company's name, but it, they asked me if I wanted to direct. Because uh, I tell you, I thought it was, I thought it was a joke to be honest with you. I really did. I think nobody's going to come up to fucking Art Camacho and ask him to direct a film. But what happened prior to that, that we were doing one movie and he wanted me to get extras for him. Like it was like a karate kid scene with a lot of tournament people. So we, we go in, in movies, see, well, they call it a tech scout. You, you know that when you go and check out the technical things, location stuff. So in the morning, we went on the scout trying to check out locations. And Joseph came to me and said, hey, Art, you know what? I'm doing this uh, karate scene. Do you think you can get me like 30 guys, you know, to be like in the audience and stuff like that and fighting? I said, yeah, absolutely. I can make two calls. I know a lot of friends. By the end of the day, 30 turned into 400. He asked me, and he was like 400 people. I was like, oh my God. In my mind, I'm thinking, how am I going to do it? But I didn't say no. I said, yeah, I'll do it. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I was going to do it. They had no money, no budget. So then he told me, he says, Art, you give me these people, I'll give you a bonus. And I go, no, no, Joseph, Joseph, you asked me as, as a favor to you. I'm going to do it as a favor. I'm not going to change the terms. I'm going to get you your people. I didn't know what to do. So I started thinking, started really thinking. And so, so basically I literally started calling schools. Hey, this is our Camacho. We're doing this. And I came up with some ideas that we'll give uh, the students, we'll give them uh, $5 towards a, a birthday party at their school or whatever. 
and uh, the instructors will give them 50 bucks. They come down and, and represent the schools. And then I called the Atomics. Uh, they're really good people. Mitch, who owns Atomics, you know, the, the clothes and shoes. I said, Mitch, I, I need some product that I can give away and raffle off to these kids. And he gave me a bunch of stuff, boxes of, of new shoes and clothes and shirts. So in my mind, I created this whole promotion, birthday parties, you know, uh, raffles. And I, w I made it like a big party scene. And so, make a long story short, is that the, the assistant director who was a friend of mine says, Art, the director's not, the producer director is not going to know how to use these people. You're only giving them five bucks a day. He's probably going to have their 16 hours if you don't help. So, so I thought, oh my God. So I came up, I drew X's and O's and X's and O's and camera moves and X's were this body and this, these were karate, these were kung fu. Came up with some crazy idea, you know? I presented it to him that morning. I said, Joseph, I don't know what you have in mind, but here's an idea. And he looked at it. He looks at four or five pages of these things. I haven't done nothing in my life. I haven't done anything. I, I don't know what I'm doing, but I had an idea. He looked at it and he started laughing and he put it down. And, and the Mexican in me got pissed. I thought he's making fun of me. I said, I worked my butt off and you're making fun of me? Okay. I said, I smiled, said, thank you. Walked out of the room. Two hours later, he comes up to me. Says Art, have you ever thought about directing? I go, yeah, I was pissed. I, I got to see for a while. I just did not want to talk to the guy. I thought he's making fun of me. And and he goes, uh, you know what? Call me. We're, I'm going to have you direct a film for me. I said, yeah, okay, cool. Just like that. <laughs> I, I thought, you know, screw you. Don't don't you know? Come on, adding salt. <laughs> right, to the right. Open wound. A week later, I get a call from the secretary, Mr. Camacho. Your appointment for next Wednesday is is ready. You know, we want to make sure you can make it. It's I think 10 or 11. Appointment for what? Well, you know, the, the film you're going to direct for us. <laughs> I said, what? I, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it, Seth Well. And that's how I got my first directing gig. That's wow. exactly. I could wow. not believe it. And to, just, just a little side note, that film, they had given us $700,000 budget. We shot it for $50,000 under budget. And I think they grossed close to $2 million on the film. Wow. So it wasn't my pretty blue eyes, but I made the money. So then, then right afterwards, they gave me another film and another film, and that's that's how I started me making people money with, with uh, directing. Great, great. You let you um, the last one I think you did was a film. It, I saw it's um, seems as though it was a Russian made film, yes. right? Or, yes. Tell tell me about that. How how did it come about? This was that. It was a crazy story. You see, well, I uh, I met this really uh, uh, actor producer named Alexander Nevsky. Nevsky. Great guy, great guy. We had met, he loved my work. He was a big fan of the 90s films. And, and he had said, Art, I want to do with, a film with you in the Philippines, an action film. I said, fantastic. A month goes by, I don't hear from him. Then he calls me up, he says, oh, Art, you know, that film fell through. You know, that's, that's Hollywood. That's Hollywood. You can't count on anything until you're on the set. But he said, look, but I have another film that I'm producing. It's not an action film. It's a historical piece. So it's about soccer and it's a love story. I said, okay, show me the script. I read the script. It was very hard to read because it was translated from, from Russian, but it was a beautiful story, Sequel. Beautiful, beautiful story. And 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 I'm thinking to myself, are you sure they got the right one you want to go direct this? It's a beautiful, not that not I can't direct, but it was historical. It wasn't action driven. It had a couple action scenes in it, but it was a group, it was a love story wrapped around the introduction of soccer historically from the British to, to uh, Russia. And next thing you know, he says, Art, next week, the, the main producer coming down from Russia, come down, I, I told him about you, because they want to give it an international feel. That's why they wanted to hire an American director. And so I met with him. And it's so funny, because all he was talking about, because he, he knows I'm an action guy, he goes, you know what, can we do action and action, get back? I said, yeah, but you've got a brilliant story, a beautiful story here, you got a real movie. I mean, I could feel action left and right, I could do that in my sleep. Sure. But I mean, to tell a good story and a love story at that. And that's what I kept stressing. I kept stressing to him. It's, he, he saw the big picture as, you know, soccer fights. I saw the big picture as a love story about these two people that are going through this journey while all this is happening in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, and literally, that's how it came about. And to date, it is it is my favorite film. It is really a powerful movie, very powerful movie. Unfortunately, yeah. it has too much of a, a Euro Eastern European feel to it. That's why it hasn't been, you know, here yet released but uh, they're they're working on that right now but it's an amazing film i was so so excited and blessed and honored to do that film it was in russia where was it, where, 
Where was it shot in? In Moscow, Russia. Oh, you went to Moscow. I went to Moscow, yeah. And was I, that the first? Was the first time you've been to Russia? Yes, yes. It was amazing because I, you know, my biggest compliment to them was like, you guys remind me of a bunch of damn Mexicans, man. They were so down to earth, man. I was expecting, you know, everybody to wear gray and this. I'm serious, stupid me. But I get there, they're more American than we are, you know. No the, kidding. The beauty, you know, the funny thing was that. But they were big fans of all those films I used to do. That's why they knew of my work. Because in those days, in the 90s, when the uh, Soviet Union dissolved, it, it, crime was rampant, bootleg. So they used to, I mean, literally, you could have one VHS at the time with Don Wilson, Van Damme, Steven Seagal, all in one tape. So they didn't have A or B films. They thought everybody was the same. And so they were big fans of this. And, and uh, coming into this experience, one of the best crews I've ever worked with. They were so excited every day to work with me as I was with them. It was such a beautiful, beautiful thing. How long was the shoot? It was, ended up like 30 or 40 days. I think 35, 36 days, yeah. At one point, we had four days where I had over 150 extras, all in period costumes, because it was set in 1910. So I had horses, carriages. I mean, I swear to you, I go to the set and you cannot tell the makeup people and wardrobe people were so brilliant. I was so, I thought, damn, you know, when I saw the people there, I didn't know that wasn't their rear wardrobe. Because I thought maybe some of these Russians are still peasants. I don't know. <laughs> right, 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 right. But yeah. uh, and then makeup was always late, and I was getting so very frustrated. Till one day I'm on the set talking about to the DP about a shot, and I turn over and I look at an extra, and then I look at him closer, and I realized that the beards and the mustache they were all meticulously put on to every extra, 150 people. It's like holy moly. No wonder they're late because they there's two ladies having to make up all these people, you know. When when was it shot last year? Uh, this was 19, 2019. 2019. Yeah, yeah, a year and a half ago, two years ago. So um, the pandemic really kind of put it backwards, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the pandemic is maybe excuse my language, but chicken shit as it sounds, it was good to me business wise. So, you know, so you consider that to be one of your best projects, right? Yes. Yes. And when it goes back to the martial arts and stunt work, which is which was one of your best? I, I know they're all good. I mean, but you yeah, gotta have one safe favorite. You know what? Believe it or not, I, I have a couple of favorite in terms of the martial arts as a director. One is my first one called The Power Within. Uh -huh. And the reason being because um, number one, it still holds a, a special place in my heart. But the story, you know, we, we spent like six months coming up with my first story for Joseph Murray for PM Entertainment, something that had to have action, but yet tell a good story. And The Power Within was just that. It was a little bit of a fantasy film, but in it, I infused a lot of my own personal philosophy on martial arts. For instance, the, 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 the last scene in the film, the writer had put that the good guy wins the bad guy in the big fight, and he beats the shit out of him because he gets some power. I said, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't do that because that's not what martial arts is about. I mean, if I get the upper hand on you, I'm not just going to start pounding you in, in real life. My thing is, you know what? I, I changed that whole thing, basically. Made him, made him show more honor and more nobility as opposed to just beating the crap out of people. And, and, I, and, I, and I took it to a point where we all go through life, just like anybody in films or whatever, is that once you reach a certain peak of success, sometimes we get kind of lost in that success. And then finally, God has a way of humbling us, <laughs> mm -hmm. brings us down, and we find a happy medium in life. And those were the, the themes that I wanted in the, in the movie, apart from the martial arts. I mean, the martial arts was great. We did, we did things <clears throat> in those days because, as you know, from these small films, you don't have that much time because you, you worked uh, on that. Uh, right. You worked with Alexander, right, on that film, the what's right. that part. Uh, I don't know how your situation was, but in a lot of films that I do, we don't have too much time to rehearse, to plan. I've done a couple of bigger ones where we do, we have weeks, but here, sometimes you got to put stuff together on the fly. And they can right. put the power within, and then another one that's close to my heart is called Confessions of a Pit Fighter. And it's basically a story about this kid from East LA who gets involved in these underground fights. And that was kind of fun. That was really, really fun. Really fun film. Again, if using a lot of my own growing up experience and into the characters. And, uh, and one thing that I always try to do, I don't always succeed, but I always try to infuse redemption in, in, in my movies because I think at the end of the day some, some in my previous life I still got to make up for something because I'm always trying to find redemption in my life and yeah. I do it through my film tell me about this the Camacho experience you've got a you it's on a sort of like a television series or some yeah. kind of uh, yeah 
How, you know, here's here's what I was saying. How crazy is life? I've been in the industry since about 1990, 91. And, and you, you, you reach highs and lows. You reach highs and lows. But the way God has been in my life, I keep reaching different peaks. Right when I think, okay, this is the best it's going to get, a new challenge comes in and, and strengthens me. The Russian film, for instance. Here I am at this point in my life and career doing all these actor films. And here they, they have me do a love story in Russia, in Russian language. How cool is that? <laughs> in the year next, I get a call during COVID because a lot of shows were, were canceled. A lot of shows were stopped producing because, you know, they didn't want people to make contact. And I got a call from LA Ray Network saying, hey, we want to do kind of a martial arts talk show that will involve the museum and martial art icons. And, uh, and they gave me a list of people that they wanted. And I said, because uh, they, they asked me, how are you going to deal with COVID? I said, well, you know, all truthfully, 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 I, I'm not good at podcast. I've never done a podcast kind of thing. I, I could probably do a talk show, but it has to be Camacho style. They go, what do you mean? It has to have action. It has to have action. I can't just have people sitting and talking. They go, great. Done. Done deal. So they say, gave, they basically gave me six episodes to do. And, and the interesting thing, the interesting thing was that I, I did the pitch and everything else, but I really didn't think they were going to take the pitch. So I didn't think it through. All of a sudden, they, they did the pitch and said, well, it's going to do the show. Then I had to design, what the hell am I going to do? I had no idea. No idea what I was doing. So so literally, I mean, me and Michael Matsuda got together and we started really designing questions, designing the show. And then to the very last minute, I thought, you know what? It's got to start with a bang. We got to start something with a bang. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. The opening of the show, every episode, I'm going to have different guys trying to beat the crap out of me. He goes, what do you mean, beat the crap out of you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to say, hey, I'm Mark Camacho. Welcome to the Camacho Experiment. Boom, guy comes on here, sticks, fight, you name it, as I'm trying to talk to the camera. And uh -huh. that worked out great. Because a couple of times I got nicked. <laughs> it's like, you know, but it was fun. It was really fun. And then, then what I did, I called some friends of mine from a group called Los Lonely Boys. They're, they're a Grammy award-winning uh, Latin rock kind of group because they had a song called Rule the World. Rule the World is such an inspirational song. I, I hope you listen to it one day because that's how I feel. Not, not in the sense that, oh, I want to conquer everybody. No, no. By Rule the World, I want to rule myself. I want to control my destiny as much as we can. And that song is so uplifting. So we got the licensing rights to use it for our title sequence. And then our title sequence was a combination of videos from my films, cars exploding, fights, you name it, and the show. Because one thing that I want to do the Camacho experiment is not just talking, learning about these icons, but it's also, I throw a lot of behind the scenes in there. So people actually see the process. They see us shooting the fights, they see us shooting the, the interviews. Then one segment, each segment has to have a teaching segment. So there's a Graciela Casillas, a friend of mine. She was the first boxing, kickboxing champion and a colleague, knife master. So I said, Graciela, we start off, as a matter of fact, we start off that that uh, that, uh, sh that that little sequence with us doing a sick drill. We're fighting with sticks. Next thing you know, I'm talking to her and telling me, I'm, I approached it, see, well, like a schmo, like somebody who doesn't know anything about martial arts. So I said, what do you call these things? Okay, they're called Kali or Screamer. How do you hold it? I want somebody out there who's never been in martial arts to learn something from the show. And so, so then she started showing me knife techniques and really sticking me. It's like, it was great, you know? So that's what the Camacho, the Camacho experience is martial arts in its totality from a combat sense. Like even with Don Wilson, I got in the ring with Don and he's showing me, I said, Don, what was your biggest thing? He says, defense, defense. He told me there was two or three fights in his career. Again, he's had a lot of illustrious career where the opponent's glove never touched his face. Complete fights where you can... So he showed me defense. Ben Yurkidis showed me that one spin uh, jump kick that he has. And uh, uh, Cynthia Rothrock showed me the, the broad swords, the Chinese hook swords. Right, right, so right. So we had fun. It was fun. It was it was an amazing experience. And they loved it, loved it, loved it. That's why we were uh, recently, we'll know soon enough that we were up for, you know, we're up for an Emmy nomination, which is kind of cool, you know? It's the most dangerous hour on television. Step into the octagon for the Camacho Experiment. What would it be like to sit down with your favorite martial arts heroes and work with them one-on-one? -on -one? Wow! Hosted by Fight Master and legendary action film director, Art Camacho. How do I do it? You'll have to watch and see.
The Camacho Experiment. Oh. What else are you gonna teach me? I like playing with knives. How many shows you folks done so far on that? Uh, we, we did six for the first season. And if they come back, they want us to do another, another uh, set. Oh, that's mm -hmm. my book. Craziness, huh? Crazy. Crazy. Well, yeah, okay, we're jumping right now into it. Tell me about this book. You know, see, well, I, <clears throat> for, for two or three years, <clears throat> different people who were, you know, independent publishers had approached me because they said, you know what, Art, you're from the barrio, you're just fat, and I was. I mean, extremely fat, ugly. I'm still ugly, but not as fat, okay? Um, but you're this kid from the barrio, you're no talented, you have nothing. All of a sudden, here you, you're reaching the pinnacle of martial arts, martial arts action. We, we, we want to do a book, we want to do, do, do some kind of biography. Just tell people, how the hell this kid from the barrio, how do you how do you connect the dots? And I said, no, no way, no how. I said, I, I, I lead a, a realistically boring life. Anybody can do what I can do, what I've done. What I've done is no big deal. I'm just very, the only thing I am is tenacious. You kick my butt, see well, I'll go down, I'll cry, wipe the boogers off my face and get back up. And that's the only thing that I can say that I have, uh, you know, against most people. But finally, Michael Matsuda, he kind of tricked me. He did an interview for a podcast like we're doing now. Three days later, he has it transcribed and he says, here's your book. I go, what are you talking about? He says, Art, I'm going to do a book about you with or without you. I said, here, <laughs> excuse my language, I use a lot of expletives. I said, you're effing this, you're effing that, you're no effing way. He goes, yes, sir, either here it is. You can add to it, you can clean it up, but I'm just gonna publish it because I got a lot of pictures offline that I can do. I'm gonna do it. So I finally agreed to, I finally agreed to, you know, so him and I collaborated, I kind of cleaned it up, cleaned up the language and gave him extra material. But then, then what made it worse as well is that he told me, Dragon Fest is a big, like martial arts Comic-Con. He says, okay, we are gonna introduce your book at Dragon Fest. I said, no if and way, no way. He shows me this big ass poster with my ugly face on it. And I'm thinking, Michael, please don't do this to me. I'm not gonna sit in a booth watching my ugly face right there on a big poster while people walk by. He's, <laughs> I sort of got, I, I was so self-conscious. That night I didn't sleep. I go there and he, and, and he sets up the books. He sets up the, you know, my little booth and everything. I said, okay, Michael, here's the deal. I'll, I'll, I'll do it under one condition. The minute I sell one book, that's all. That's all. Then I'm. A, then I already sold the book. I'm getting the hell out of there. I'm not going to sit there and make a fool of myself. We sold, you know, like 150 books that that one day at that drag. I was just shocked, shocked, shocked. Because the book. You know, here's the thing, Z Files. That <clears throat> I can't go into it a lot because we don't have the time. But I've had so many failures in my life, in, in, in my relationships, in my businesses, getting beat up, getting bullied. I've had so much. But having said that, I am so happy for every one of them. Every one of them. The girls who turned me down, the guys who bullied me, the guys who leave me with the scars. Every day I wake up and see those scars and I thank them. I want to beat the shit out of them, but I thank them because that made me what I am. Because that's that's the message of Art Camacho is that, you know, life's going to kick your butt, but so what? So what? Come on. You know, you make it what you want to, you know? Generally, I think we can. You're you're a proof of that, Sifu. You're you're such a great inspiration to me and to a lot of people around the world. Yeah. You know? Well, failures. You know, we all got we all go through failures, and God God gives us only a, only what we can handle, the amount of what we can handle. And yeah, every failures that you've had or or I've had or you know people that have had, what it is, they never get, having the attitude of never giving up. You know, stand up, come up, fight more. Matter of fact, I think maybe you got the same kind of blood I got. Is just that you, if you hit me, you better freaking hit me hard, because when I come up, I'm going to hit you ten times harder. That kind of attitude, because it's like every failure or every hit is like a spike of adrenaline. You know, get up! What the hell are you doing out there? And you know, this, that's the kind of subject you and I can talk about. We can get so freaking emotional about it because it's like, you know, what the hell do you think you're doing? I mean, yeah. failure, screw you. Failure is not going to do it. And then you get up, you know? And and it was always, I, I felt the same thing like you. I mean, you know, there were times when, you know, they would put me in front of it, especially during the time that when I was fighting, you know, oh, you got to go in and fight these guys. You know, oh man, shit. You know, I fought him before and he beat me. 
but that time is not going to happen so it keeps on going you know one thing about it about we don't what it is is that people recognize a lot of our success but they don't even know the the failures that you go through and i know that when you when i look at the films and i see you doing this in here and i'm thinking you know it's not all gravy you know it, it, it's not all gravy because he had worked his ass off to get there and now it is shining it is it is it is manifesting into something it's like even during your darkest days is the only time that you're going to see the bright stars anyway and yeah. the star in you is coming out you see and when i when i see that i say you know what people may not have appreciate him then but i tell you it's just that the wisdom and experience and the age you come up with you know what that's an icon that's an icon you're going to be standing way ahead of guys that that are looking and say you know and what is happening is just that i would say that there is life after black belt it is not that when you get your black belt it goes into the into the closet you've taken your martial arts and have made it your career and 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 it has opened up a lot of things so when you take a look at the film the the stunt work your books your performance your seminars it's totally incredible you know it, it's like i don't think it's like you would say that being in the right place at the right time uh that's partly true but i also see you opened the doors and you made the doors you didn't just wait for it to come open so you know all right for you i mean that that that's, that's, that's incredible you know i mean i mean so they say that opportunities you know knock only once well the hell you said the hell with it i'm going to make my own opportunities and i saw it you know and this incredible and that alone is so inspirational you know so you know there's so much we could we could go into you know if if you were to if you would have say like go ahead what is it you test on it right there because see what the end of the day i swear to god and this is what you know it's my pet peeve on uh, on social media that these people um go out there and they pity me oh look at me i got this and that you know what i got every, every day see who well, i have to struggle i have to struggle every day i get up i have to train i have to, even right now this morning i had to do a lot of calls then i had to rush to the gym work out an hour and a half come back shower because it's it's my job it's my it's my i guess it sounds corny but it's my calling to do what i'm doing because i'm living my passion and uh, but here's the thing not most people not not everybody is willing to put in the work the work this is in my mind i eat sleep and breathe this see well i just finished a film right now where i was doing a stunt <clears throat> helping uh, coordinating a stunt for for this girl she falls down she's being dragged I hadn't done that that kind of gag in years so like for 2 or 3 days before I was mulling it over mulling it over practicing and working and working when I walk on the set it's like okay well do this do that do that this grabber and people are looking like holy shit this guy's a genius he just came up with this stuff right here they don't know I spent 3 days you know planning I just make it look easy it is an easy it's hard when I direct a film see well even now even now I get so scared I get butterflies, I get nervous. But by the time I'm on the set, it's our Camacho. Like, hey, come on, just do this with the camera here, just do this, talk to the actors. But inside it's like <laughs> people don't see that, you know? You don't well, see Well, that's the it, that's anticipation. That's you know, I what, what did I see this? I says um um anticipation of death is greater than death itself, <laughs> which means that the anticipation of doing something is it it you freaking out, man. But yeah. the minute you on stage where the pressure is there the pressure is not there because you just pre- perform like hey this so what you know this is every day with me and you know that that is a sign of a real good performer because if i said it if a performer go out there and he's never had butterflies butterflies he's actually lying to himself you know or well, maybe he's on some kind of uh, talk or whatever that you know he's not even in this world but you know when you're self-conscious about everything i mean even the greatest people I, and you know that because i sometimes i read biographies on some of the actors and everything they all get butterflies they all puke just like like what what did i read about mike tyson before he even go out to a fight he's already throwing up before he even gets in there <laughs> i mean so we all go through through that but you're incredible i mean yeah. you know you're incredible because you know i've seen you grow 
you know i've yeah. seen the things that you've done you know and it's like i'm you know so that my 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 the thing one of the things i think about is this what would have happened if i would have been in southern california and and working with you folks you know oh yeah oh my you god just, look at you i mean oh my god yeah but but then i start thinking too you know um there's sacrifices in life yes. you know and i think you know i love where i'm at in hawaii and if things come my way yeah i'll do it yeah. but but for for people to say and stray they say would you go to los angeles you know and, and i would say not right now i mean <laughs> i'm enjoying it um i think where i'm at is just god blessed me here yeah. and frankly i've had a lot of people that come from la or other places want wanted to prepare for for stunt work so they come study with me and i send them out so yeah. I don't have to go anywhere, you know. I'm doing what I love to do and everything. But one day I'd like to be up there and just, all right, we're going to do something together. Yeah, you're on my bucket list. You and I are going to team up and do something so amazing, so well, so amazing. And well, again, I think at the end of the day, like I was telling you, most people out there, there's two things that I see that are pet peeves of mine. One is that they don't want it bad enough. They think, okay, I want this, but you know what? That's too hard. Or they they get a little failure. Ah, you know what? I'll stay in my safe zone. And two, here's the, here's the most important critical thing, Steve. Well, they both as martial artists or actors. They, when I started martial arts, to be honest with you, when I first started, I just wanted to beat the shit out of people because they beat the shit out of me. But then I started understanding, and I got found the right teachers with with, with Steve Eric Lee and your system. And but most people, not most, a lot of people as actors, they go out there, and I see this especially now in this age of social media. They want to be celebrities. They want to be stars. They don't want to be actors. They they want to be a black belt. They don't want to be a martial artist. I never I never pushed for a promotion. I never pushed for anything because I just wanted to be a good martial artist. Whether I was a white belt, blue belt, black, it doesn't matter. A good martial artist, not to have the belt and call me, you know, put put me call me GM, call me this, call me that. No, no, no. I mean that's a title that's earned, not where you know. I'm always Art Camacho. People call me what they want to call me, but a lot of people go out there and they want to be. You know this, this grandmaster, this grandmaster, or or in acting they want to be a celebrity, they want to be a star. Look at me. Well, no, no, I I'd rather work on my craft. I want to be great at what I do, and then everything is a byproduct of that. You know, it's um, whenever you get good at what you do, you don't even have to wear about worry about um, you know, the stardom or the money or anything else that way. Because people will recognize you for your work, and they will come to you instead of you going to them, yeah. Um, and and that I see because you've concentrated so much in being who you are, making yourself, you know, that good martial artist, that good director, stunt personality, and everything. People are going to you. They come into you. Say, man, I gotta have Art Camacho, so your name become international. It's not like you going around and just. Slapping resumes and biographies on 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 top of, of, of producers and things that way, you've already got that. It's already established, and with your book that's here, you know, and then with your art commercial experience, that's already walking into a gunfight with right hand and left hand guns. You're not coming with just one pistol. You coming is like bam, 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 blazing. And it's like, my case, it's like oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, you're just shooting it out, and I see more great things coming. I don't think, you know, as, you know God willing, that you know, I don't think that uh, you're going to ever be stopping. I think you're going to be working all the way to your grave. <laughs> that's, that's my goal. That's my goal. I do. I mean, I, I see a lot of friends who, who have jobs and they're they're counting the years till they retire, and I tell them, you know, what, when I'm six feet under or my ashes are in a Ben, that's when I retire. You know, I'm having too much fun. Uh, you know, I see some photos of that you're doing. That I, I'm kind of curious about that because I don't know whether it's a uh, it's it got to be a period film. One uh, in um, uh, a cowboy oh, fighting yeah. scene. I just did this film in Arizona called Assault on Rio Bravo. It was my first western. I did all the action. I didn't direct it, but I directed you know all the action, basically choreographed it. And uh, that was the funnest, funnest time. This I just did uh, recently, very recently. Oh my God, I had the best time. Um, I love. I always wanted to do a western. Always wanted to do a western, and here I got to do a western. So many things, and it was so fun. Because you know what? Matter of fact, one one gun sequence we had where this guy's going to mow through like I don't know, maybe a dozen people, and I that's where I brought my martial arts in. I made it like a first. I started with with a kata that I made out, you know, with movement a kata. And then 
I put a gun in there and then I modified it. So that's basically, when you see the film, it's basically a kata that I, that I turned into a gunfight. It was so fun, so fun. I see, I see Alex in there, right? Yes, yes. And what, how, did, how did it come off? Because he has a real heavy accent. Yeah, well, basically, it's a historical film. There was a real Russian character in the 1800s who came from Russia in the in, in America. So he played really? that character. So he was wow. like, uh, you know, we made him like the Terminator of the Old West, you know? I bet he enjoyed it playing a cowboy, oh, huh? God, he was like a kid in a candy store. And like I told you, I, I everything I do, I go back to, to you and Steve Warwick Lee and all my mentors in martial arts because I cross-trained with many men, uh, martial artists like Samuel Kwok, Sifu Samuel Kwok and Wing Chun, all kinds of stuff. But that's my foundation to everything I do begins and ends with the martial arts. That's your first Western, right? Yes, yes. Um, did it come out yet or? Uh, no, no, we just we just wrapped up about three weeks ago. So when, when do you expect the release? I'm hoping, I'm hoping later this year, or early next year. But my God, I had the funnest time, more, more fun than I've had in the last 15 years. You know, see, see well, that's what I'm saying about life is that you would think after somebody reaches a certain point that, okay, you're, you're here, but all of a sudden I go to Russia. Then the Camacho experiment, and then now doing a Western. So each time, life is giving me brilliant new experiences, and I just can't. I'm so blessed and so lucky, you know. Have you uh, worked on any kind of science fiction yet? Not yet. I want to. That's that's next on my list. You working with you and a science fiction film is on my bucket list. Great, yeah, because we got a lot of good ideas on that. You know, we might yeah. pitch you and and see where we go on that. So you know, if if um, life experience to everything that you've ever been through, you have a guy that's coming up into the martial arts, just interested in it, but is going through a lot of ups and downs. What kind of inspiration would you give this person to motivate him to go after the dream, any dream that he has? First off, slap him in the face. How bad do you want to, to, to live a good life? Because what I did, see, well, I at one time, sounds kind of crazy. I sat down when I was very young. I was so screwed up. I told you, the first two girls that I fell in love with, I wanted so bad, tell me to go screw myself. In, not in so many words, but the, the, everything I did, I, I got so much rejection. And, and one day I started reading books on psychology. I mean, literally as a kid, even as a kid, I was so, and what I did, I read this one thing that this, this one author asked, he goes, this is who you are. And this is who people perceive you to be. And here's who you want to be. So when, when, those, when I posed those questions to me, I, I literally got a piece of paper and I wrote down who Art Camacho, who I would, hey, you know what? If I could dream of being anybody, who would I be? So I said, Art Camacho, okay, he's this, he's that. He's literally who I became. So I created what I am inside because I, I, I had a definite, definite vision. You have to have dif uh, what is it? specificity in your vision. You can't just say, I want to be a great guy. I want to be successful. You got to be, okay, Art Camacho, he's very confident, great martial, well, not that I'm a great martial artist, a good martial artist, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a, a good director. You know, those are, I basically, basically what you see is what I created when I was 15, 16. And I had that image in my head of who I wanted to be. I wasn't there, but I, but I really strived to, that was my goal. And that's what I would tell them. Where do you want to be? Where, who, who do you want to be? You could be anything and you can see, well, it generally with the exceptions in life, I've learned you can be whoever you want to be. I and you wrote it. That's, that's that's the message of the book. That's the message of my life. Is I am proof that you can be whoever you want to be. I'm a fat little piece of shit kid from the barrio, and here I am making movies, traveling around the world, magazines, blah blah blah. blah. You know, it's fun, and I'm living a dream. And this is a dream scene for us. Still to this day, I think, holy crap, I cannot believe what I what I'm doing. What you did was actually you already prof prophesized and then fulfilled that prophecy and it's still going on. Yes, and Absolutely. beyond anything I expected, to be honest with you, I, if somebody would told me you're going to be directing a Russian language film in Russia, ah, you're going to do your own talk show. <laughs> Are you nuts? You know? Yeah, it's pretty difficult when you're doing it in Russian and then go a period film. That's, yeah. that's, a, that's, a, dub, that's a double whammy. You oh, know, yeah. doing, do, doing it in Russian in modern days, you know, it's it's pretty challenging, but doing it in period film, wow, that must be, that's epic. That's totally epic. And I, I, I really wish the best for everything in that film. And I can't wait to, 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 to see it, you know? Well, Art, you know, there's so many things that we can do. And I'm sure that along the way, you know, we're going to come up with part two on Art Camacho, probably with uh, a little bit more gray and uh, hair a little bit more. You know, I'll, I'll be, I still love the grays. <laughs> right, you know? 
And it has been an enjoyable time just interviewing and talking to you. And the things that you've done, what can I say? I mean, it's just like inspirational. And I just encourage people that if they can, where can they pick your book up anyway? Right now it's on Amazon. They could they could contact me through Facebook. I'll I could I'll market. I sell them and then I autograph them. But they can also get them on Amazon direct. Real quick story. I, years ago, as a kid, I remember watching this movie called Jesus Christ Superstar. Incredible right. movie. I don't know if you remember that. It was a great movie. Then it became a, a musical, or a musical was before anyway. So the actor Ted Neely, who who did the movie, he started doing the musical around the world, and um, I had the honor of seeing him several times in the music because I love the I love the movie. And and one day I met him. I met him afterwards because he does that. Sometimes he'll meet with people afterwards. So I met him. I mean, we had this amazing, amazing talk. And one two two things that stuck out to me. I asked him about the scene in uh in, in, in Jesus' life in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is having his doubts. And I asked him what his inspiration was for that. And, and he told me, he says Art, you know what? When I perform that scene, it's not a man talking to God. It's a son talking to his father, asking him, why, father? Why am I going through all this hurt and this pain if you love me? And wow, I almost I almost cried, see, well, when he was explaining that to me. And um, we talked about many other things. And then at the very end, he signed my booklet. And he says, Art, great knowing you and blah, blah, blah. And he, and he wrote something that I stole from him now to this day. And I want to leave this interview with that. He says, Art keep living the dream and that's what i that's what i sign now on every book every picture everything i sign off every time on social media keep living the dream or live the dream because we can see for well too many of us don't think i wouldn't have thought as this fat little kid from the barrio that i'd ever be in movies that i'd ever be directing that i'd ever be acting i mean doing what i'm doing mm. but god and myself and, and and again all the people around me like yourself and see for eric lee and see for seven o'clock all these people who who mentored me, led me to this. Without you, without Steve Eric Lee, I am not our commuter. Basically, I don't fulfill my dreams. So I thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. For living yeah, the dream. That's incredible. Let me just add on that. When you say, keep living your dream, that's a fantastic. I always tell people, keep living your dreams, but wake up and make it reality. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's it. Art, thank you very much. It's been a very good time. We spent a great time together just talking about this scenario. And I know that we could go into a whole lot of bunch of things, but I'm going to save that for the next time. All right, I want you to, uh, 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 you know, just, uh, well, hey, I'll give you a good clap for, for, for being with us. You know? and, um, and, and the next time we're going to be seeing you. So, okay, Art, right, have a great day. Enjoy yourself. And remember, remember, remember this. Hawaii is still open, you know, you can come visit anytime. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go. And we can hang out and sit on the beach and watch all the coconuts, <laughs> coconut trees, I mean, okay? <laughs> all right, you take care of yourself. Okay. Love you, guy. Aloha, mahalo. Bye-bye. Thank you, Art. And again, thank you very much, everybody, for watching this uh, Beyond Kicking and Punching with Sifu Alda Cascos and Art Camacho. For me, myself, I've learned so much from this interview. It was so, so inspiring. The biggest take I actually got from this interview was that, you know, Art didn't just wait for opportunities to come. He actually saw it and he took it and he took it without even knowing what he was going to do and how to do it he just said i'm gonna do it anyway and figure it out later <laughs> and see most people all they do is they make excuses they listen to that negativity in their head going i don't know how to do that what am i gonna do to do that but instead you should learn from his experience and his saying right there just do it anyway okay face the fear and do it anyway so again thank you very much guys if you love this or if you've learned something from it like it love it share it and don't forget to subscribe to sifu wow's podcast beyond kicking and punching aloha take care thank you again Art. thank you sifu wow bye guys bye bye God bless.